Okay. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, um, and thank you all for coming, including those of you turning in, tuning in online, uh, whether now on November 30th, 2022, or deep into the future. Um, all support is greatly appreciated. Institute for the Study of Antiquity and Christian Origins in Religious Studies, uh, they've provided for tonight's reception, and thank you, Karen. Um, and the team here at the Ransom Center, Phoebe, Doug, Daniel, Elizabeth, Amber, Leslie, and our wonderful volunteers, Barbara and Betsy, and last but not at all least, our bartender, Ruben. Thank you all. <laughs> I'm going to hand things over just in a moment to Dr. Asfar Moeen, who will speak for a few minutes about the incredible work of UT's Department of Religious Studies. First, though, a very quick run of show. Once Osfar introduces Dr. Smith, the lecture itself will run for about 40 to 45 minutes. Then I'll come back up with Jeff to moderate Q&A and make sure we get all of you out to the reception and to the display of the Willoughby Papyrus alongside the Gutenberg Bible at 5.30. Those of you streaming live um, should absolutely drop questions in the YouTube chat. Um, there's no way I'll get to all of them, but I'll be able to see them on my phone, and I'll be sure to ask one or two to Jeff um, when we're on the stage together. Okay, Dr. Asfar Moeen studies the early, Islamic, early modern Islamic world from comparative perspectives with a focus on concepts and practices of sovereignty. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Millennial Sovereign, Sacred Kingship and Sainthood in Islam, which focuses on the development of Mughal kingship in relationship to Safavid and to Murid history in Iran and Central Asia. Recently, he edited a journal special issue on political theology in the Mughal Empire and with Dr. Alan Strathern at Oxford, a major collection of essays on sacred kingship in world history. He currently serves as an editor for Modern Asian Studies published by Cambridge University Press. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. And uh, welcome to everyone here. Um, I know I, I wasn't on the program, but uh, you see, Dr. Smith is so famous that they had to invite me to introduce him to you. Uh, <clears throat> but before I do so, I, I would like to express my appreciation to the Harry Ransom Center for collaborating on this exciting venture with the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, <clears throat> And I would like to say a few things, a few words about our department. Uh, but let me begin with a personal anecdote, which is when my friends and family learn that I study kingship, the first question is often why study kings and why on earth in the Department of Religious Studies? In response, I like to quote A.M. Hocart, uh, a pioneering anthropologist who said, and I quote, we have no right in the present state of our knowledge to assert that the worship of gods preceded that of kings. We do not know." End quote. In other words, what did humans worship first, kings or gods? With Hokart's striking, if controversial, question, the conversation becomes a lot more interesting and heated, uh, especially when the realization sets in that in many of the world's religions, God is indeed a king. My point simply is that the study of religion is often not what people think it is. Done properly, cri critically, and creatively, it can lead to remarkable insights into our world. We are fortunate indeed to have a Department of Religious Studies on this campus. At the University of Michigan, where, for example, where I did my PhD, there was no such department. One had to study religion either in history, anthropology, area, or cultural studies. As this shows, the study of religion is by nature cross-disciplinary. We have on our faculty historians, philologists, ethnographers, archeologists, and we teach our students not only about different religious traditions, but <coughs> also sociology, anthropology, psychology, and even the economics of religion. Our undergraduate majors can take one of three tracks, comparative religious studies, to understand different traditions in relation to one another. Second, social justice, ethics, and religion, to grapple with fundamental problems of, of morality and justice. And third, global interreligious dynamics to examine how the world is shaped by the competition and interaction between religious communities. At the graduate level, things become even more interesting given the range of our faculties, research interests that span most of the world's major religions 
as well as less familiar ones. Let me just highlight three initiatives. One is the Caribbeanist Labs on Religion, or CLR, named after CLR James. Uh, for those of you who may have heard of the ca famous Caribbean intellectual, dedicated to the study of religion in the Caribbean, where many of the world's religions from Asia, Africa, and the New World came together to create a highly cosmopolitan religious milieu. Another is the study of secularism and the so-called religions of no religion. As showcased in a major conference, the department organized this term on material religion in the Americas. A third is the Institute for the Study of Antiquity and Christian Origins, or ISAAC for short, which has sponsored archeological and manuscript research on early Christianity and related traditions across the ancient Mediterranean. Today's talk is by the director of ISAAC, Dr. Jeff Smith, who's associate professor and fellow of the Boyer Farmer Chair in Biblical Studies. Dr. Smith received a PhD in religions of Mediterranean antiquity from Princeton University in 2013. He is a scholar of the New Testament and early Christianity, whose research interests include Paul and the Pauline traditions, patristics, orthodox and heresy, papyrology, and something called Valentinianism, which you can ask him about. <clears throat> He has published two books, Guilt by Association, Heresy Catalogues in Early Christianity, published by Oxford University Press, Valentinian Christianity, Texts and Traditions, published by University of California Press. He is currently working on a third book, co-authored with Brent Landau, who is also on our faculty. Uh, the book is called The Secret Gospel of Mark, A Rogue Scholar, A Controversial Gospel of Jesus, and the Fierce Debate Over Its Authenticity going to come out from uh, Yale University Press. His research has been covered by several media outlets, including CNN, the BBC, and the New York Times. Let me invite him to tell you in his own words why his research has generated such media interests. Professor Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Osfar, for that generous introduction. Uh, and thank you to all in attendance this evening. It is indeed a rare occasion to celebrate the acquisition of a Greek New Testament papyrus. Most of these kinds of manuscripts, and there aren't many, were discovered during excavations in the late 19th and 20th centuries and belong to older university and museum collections, mostly in Europe. New Testament papyri surface from time to time when some researcher looks through the university or museum's holdings and discovers uh, an unidentified manuscript of interest. These are the kinds of bins you have to look through. Such is the case at, say, Oxford University, where the boxes of papyri dug up over a century ago in the Egyptian city of Oxyrhynchus continue to yield New Testament papyri on a somewhat regular basis. But the occasion is different today. Uh, today we welcome a papyrus of the Gospel of John into the collection here at the Harry Ransom Center. Now, before we turn to the manuscript itself and what we can learn from it, I'd like to thank a few people who have worked behind the scenes to make this day possible. Special thanks to my department chair, Dr. Osfar Moin who was supportive when I first approached him with the idea of trying to acquire the Willoughby papyrus back in, and I checked my records, September of 2020. Now, September of 2020, as many of you might recall, was not an easy time. And I'm grateful to Dr. Moeen for enthusiastically taking up this ambitious project in the midst of all of the chaos going on at the time in the Department of Religious Studies, in the university, and in indeed in the world. I'd also like to thank UT's development office, in particular KC Landry, who helped us raise the funds needed to acquire the Willoughby Papyrus. Special thanks to, to the member of the Longhorn Nation who sponsored the purchase of the papyrus. Now, patrons have played a, 
a long and essential role in the Christian tradition, going back to the time of Jesus himself. Jesus, who famously relied on the material support of others after he quit his day job to travel and spe spread the good news. And so our donor continues in this long tradition of supporting worthwhile causes. Thank you for believing in this project and for making it possible. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of the staff here at the Harry Ransom Center for working behind the scenes to relocate the papyrus to Austin, make room for it in the collection, and make this event today a reality. I am particularly grateful to Aaron Pratt uh, and Megan Bernard. And to echo a recent social media post from a prominent New Testament scholar, it's nice to know that the Willoughby papyrus is now in good hands. Now on to the manuscript. The Willoughby Papyrus is a small fragment that consists of John chapter 1, verses 49 through 2, 1. The final portion of the calling of Nathaniel and the other disciples, and the beginning of the wedding at Cana, uh, um, and that's what's on the front side. On the back side here is an unidentified Christian text, which we'll talk more about tonight. The text of John on the front has received the Gregory Alon designation P134, meaning it was the 134th Greek New Testament papyrus registered in that list. There have since been a few more added. On the basis of the style of the handwriting, both sides of the fragment were likely, at least in my estimation, copied uh, sometime in the 3rd or 4th century, um, and I think probably by the same scribe. It's a small fragment, as you will see when you view, uh, view it here in the lobby. Uh, perhaps no bigger than a credit card. I just double-checked. I'd say it's smaller than a credit card. Um, but despite its small size, the Willby Papyrus is an exceptional manuscript, as we shall see tonight. We must start with the question of provenance. That is, where did it come from? Now, there are two senses to this question. The first is, where and when was the manuscript discovered? Unfortunately, there's little that we can say with certainty about where or when the Willoughby papyrus was unearthed, other than to say likely somewhere in Egypt and sometime in the late 19th or early 20th century. The arid climate in Egypt, particularly south of the delta, makes possible the preservation of organic material like papyrus for centuries and in some cases millennia. And the vast majority of our papyrus manuscripts that have survived into the present day hail from Egypt. And further, most of these papyrus manuscripts came to light in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, centuries, the heyday for archaeological digs and the antiquities trade in Egypt. More than this cannot be said about where and when the Willoughby papyrus first saw the light of day. But there is a second sense of the term provenance. How and under what circumstances did the manuscript come into our possession? Not only is this question one we can answer, but the answer, I think, is quite astounding. There's no shortage of great fine stories in the field of ancient Christian manuscript studies. Perhaps the most famous fine story is that of the Nag Hammadi Library. The story goes that in 1945, a peasant by the name of Muhammad Ali al-Saman was out digging uh, along the banks of the Nile for fertilizer. When the Nile floods and then recedes, it leaves a nutrient-rich soil behind. Uh, and when he, chanced upon, when he was looking for fertilizer, he chanced upon an earthen jar. This is Muhammad Ali al-Saman himself, and these are the manuscripts he found. He chanced upon this jar, and he hesitated at first. The story goes, fearing that a jinn or a demon might emerge from the vessel. But curiosity got the best of him, so he smashed the jar open with an axe, revealing 12 ancient books filled with previously unknown ancient Christian writings in the Coptic language. Another great fine story is that of the letter to Diognetus. I'm guessing many of you probably haven't heard this story. The letter to Diognetus only survived into the modern period in a single manuscript. It's an important early Christian apologetic text. That is, it's written in part to defend Christianity from its critics, both Jews and non-Jews. 
The text was not known to have existed until it surfaced sometime around 1436 in Constantinople in a most unexpected place. In a fishmonger's shop, among a pile of papers intended for wrapping fish. Now to this day, scholars have no clue how the letter to Diagnetus ended up where it did. But fortunately, a young cleric named, named Thomas de Rezo rescued the manuscript from the pile and, uh, by purchasing it from the shop owner and placed it in capable hands. By the, late uh, by the late 1500s, the manuscript had been transcribed and published. That is, it had been copied out by hand by scholars trained in deciphering manuscripts. And the first print edition of the text appeared in 1586. Now, the Willoughby papyrus was not found in a jar, uh, nor was it found, to my knowledge, among fish papers. Uh, but it, too, made its appearance under unusual, even exceptional circumstances. The story, as far as I can reconstruct it, is as follows. In about 1990, a man inherited a house from a family member. And while he knew the attic to contain a suitcase full of papers belonging to his deceased relative, Harold Willoughby, longtime professor of ancient religion at the University of Chicago, he, did, he didn't take the time to look through Professor Willoughby's papers until early in 2015. But that changed in January of that year when, in the owner's own words, I took the time to go through the suitcase and the papyrus fell out from a stack of letters and papers." End quote. Now, what fell out was exactly what you will see in the lobby. That is, uh, the papyrus in its original mount, meticulously conserved, and labeled John 1, 50-51. Now, we've been able to see traces of the previous verse and the following verse, so we've broadened it a little bit. Now, unaware of the historical significance of his discovery and having admittedly little need for a scrap of ancient papyrus, the owner then decided to list the fragment for sale on eBay. $99, no reserve. Within hours, the listing caught the attention of scholars worldwide <laughs> who blogged about it and shared links to the auction on social media. While manuscripts do appear uh, on eBay from time to time, this was not a typical listing. In, in contrast to the crude forgeries that surface on the site, the Willoughby papyrus looked authentic. It also did not resemble the illicit papyri that occasional appear, occasionally appear on eBay unmounted, unidentified, and often sprinkled with a suspicious layer of dirt, as if recently snatched from a plundered tomb or yanked from the sands of Egypt by some enterprising looter. Now, Greek papyri of the New Testament are rare. Today, only 141 have been published, and among these, only 32 include the Gospel of John. Yet, because Greek papyri tend to be the earliest New Testament manuscripts, they are among the most important for establishing the original words written by the New Testament authors. For these reasons, I remember at the time, back in 2015, asking myself upon seeing the eBay listing, could this be an authentic and legitimate papyrus of the Gospel of John? And if so, why hasn't anybody known of its existence until now? The listing seemed too good to be true. But I had to learn more about the manuscript, so I immediately contacted the seller, and after a lengthy, I mean lengthy, email exchange, uh, I convinced him to end the auction prematurely, to remove the listing from eBay, and to allow me to publish uh, an article about the fragment, so at the very least, the scholarly world would have a record of its existence. And I remain grateful to this day to the owner for recognizing the historical value of the papyrus and for allowing me to make available to the scholarly community images and an edition of this intriguing manuscript. In April of 2015, I traveled to meet the owner, photograph the manuscript, and conduct an autopsy or an in-person evaluation of the manuscript. The owner brought the papyrus to my hotel, 
The plan was to examine and image the manuscript in the hotel's well-lit business room. But I discovered upon arrival that the hotel, that the business room was being used by members of a local pest control company <laughs> who had reserved the business center for the entire weekend for a conference or a symposium or whatever format insect exterminators choose to meet. If the first round of published images are not great, it's because I had to take them in my dimly lit hotel room where we were forced to retreat to that day. As I conducted research for my article over the following months, I learned more about the initial owner of the papyrus. Documentation I was able to uncover proved that the fragment did indeed once belong to Harold R. Willoughby, not only a scholar of ancient religion, but a noted bibliophile as well. Throughout the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, Willoughby worked closely with his colleague Edgar J. Goodspeed to amass a collection of manuscripts for the University of Chicago from dealers and private collectors in the United States and abroad. Willoughby was instrumental in acquiring several illuminated manuscripts, manuscripts with hand-drawn images in them, including the so-called Rockefeller McCormick New Testament, a, I think I have a picture of this one, yes, a complete Byzantine New Testament with more than 90 illustrations, as well as the Silver Gospels, an Armenian manuscript bound in silver. He even published a Greek lectionary that was formerly used as an oath book for patrons of Colosimo's Cafe, a Chicago-area restaurant owned and operated by notorious mobster Jim Colosimo. Now, if there are any mafia aficionados in the room, uh, you'll likely know that Colosimo's Cafe was where Al Capone got his start. This experience, in Harold Willoughby's own words, brought gangland suddenly near. Now, given what, that Willoughby interacted with a number of manuscript dealers over a period of three decades, it's not possible to determine where or when he acquired the papyrus. That the manuscript belonged to Willoughby can be established on the basis of its appearance as MS4 in a list entitled manuscript collection of H.R. Willoughby, written in Harold Willoughby's own handwriting. I'm happy to report that the Harry Ransom Center received this original inventory list along with the papyrus. Willoughby's ownership of the papyrus can also be proven by the mention of, quote, a papyrus fragment mounted on glass, John 1, in an inventory of his estate prepared after his death in 1962. Although not absolutely certain, it would seem reasonable to conclude uh, from this list uh, that Willoughby designated only MS4 as a papyrus um, because among the seven listed manuscripts, MS4 was the only papyrus in the collection. Now having said that, the remaining six Greek and Latin manuscripts, likely parchments, their whereabouts are at present unknown. Now, additional documentation of this fragment recently surfaced among the papers of Harold Willoughby at the, in the Special Collections Research Center at the Regenstein Library in the University of Chicago. There's a folder labeled by Willoughby himself, Chicago Willoughby Collection Manuscript Papyrus Frags. That's a folder I'd open. The folder contains only two negatives uh, of the front and of the back of the Willoughby papyrus, apparently taken prior to its mounting. I've been able to determine that the negatives were taken at the latest not long after 1951 or 1952. Printed on the edge uh, of the negatives are the words Eastman Nitrate Kodak. Now on account of the combustibility of nitrate, which caused several fires in cinemas and film vaults in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Kodak began to phase out nitrate in the late 1940s, a process that was completed by 51 or 52. At this point, Kodak switched, switched to acetate film and replaced the word nitrate with safety to reassure customers that their negatives will no longer spontaneously combust. 
In other words, Harold Willoughby must have acquired and imaged the papyrus no later than the early 50s, at a time when nitrate film was uh, still readily available. And so even if we cannot determine precisely, determine precisely where or when he acquired the fragment, the handwritten inventory, the estate paperwork, the negatives, they all demonstrate that the papyrus was part of Harold Willoughby's personal collection prior to his death in 1962, and that he imaged the papyrus already in or before the 19, early 1950s. Therefore, the fragment complies fully with the 1970 UNESCO Convention on Cultural Property. A famous book collector, a long forgotten suitcase stashed away in an attic, sudden appearance on eBay, the story of the Willoughby Papyrus is remarkable indeed. The papyrus itself turned out to be as exceptional as the circumstances of its discovery. I'd like to highlight today two of its most remarkable features, its format and its contents. Now, Judaism and Christianity are known as religions of the book. That is, they are both considered to be religions with authoritative scriptures. Yet while they are both religions of the book, in antiquity at least, their books tended to appear in different formats. Jews tended to prefer the scroll. Consider, for example, the great Isaiah scroll, in, um, the great Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls discovery, which is more than 24 feet long. Scrolls like the Isaiah scroll are inscribed on one side and rolled up with the blank side facing out. Ancient Christians, however, preferred the Codex. That is, the book as we know it today. Pretty much any book you pick up will be in the Codex format. Codices, the plural of Codex. Uh, the pages of Codices are inscribed on both sides. They're folded up and sometimes protected with book covers. Uh, this is an early Christian Codex. Um, and you can see that it still has its ancient binding intact, and they would, um, much like uh, book production today, they would uh, produce the book with several choirs, stitch those choirs together, and I think in, this, in antiquity this book did have a book cover. It's a different format from a scroll. Now the Jewish preference for the scroll and the Christian preference for the codex are well documented in the material record, but these preferences can also be seen in the iconography of both religions in antiquity and beyond. But since the first Jesus followers were not yet members of a distinct Christian religion, but members of a sect within Judaism, scholars surmise that there must have been a time, a time very early on, when New Testament writings were routinely written on scrolls. What is particularly striking about the Willoughby Papyrus it is, is that it is the first known defensible example of a New Testament papyrus written on a scroll. The vast majority of New Testament papyri take the form of the Codex. Now, there are a few New Testament papyrus scrolls that do survive, uh, but they're written on the back side of existing scrolls. This is an example. Uh, uh, they are scrolls not by design, but instead they take the form of the book they are repurposing. So this is a great example. This is, uh, this is a fragment from the letter uh, to the Hebrews from the New Testament, but it's actually written on the, and it's written in a scroll format, so there are many fragments of this that go on and on and on. It's written on the backside of a pre-existing scroll of Livy, the Roman historian. Okay, so these are of a different sort. They're recycled paper, or re recycled papyrus, rather than intended as born scrolls. But the scribe of our papyrus seems to have wanted his copy of the Gospel of John to be on a scroll. Now, as the sole example of a Greek New Testament papyrus intentionally copied onto a scroll, the Willoughby papyrus has much to reveal about Jewish and Christian relations in the ancient world, as well as the history of the early Christian book. Now I want to talk a little bit here about how papyrus is made. So on the bottom, we have a modern piece of papyrus that is made in the ancient way, but happens to be backlit so that you can see that there are horizontal fibers and then there are vertical fibers. 
Uh, these fibers are made when you cut down the papyrus plant. This is the UT turtle pond, which has a little cluster of dwarf papyrus growing in it. Um, don't take, don't cut any down and make papyrus today, but if you want to see it up close and personal. Um, so what you do is uh, you, would, you would take the papyrus, you would peel off the green bark, and then you would shave the pith into thin shavings. You would lay it down vertically or horizontally first, and then you would switch it for the top layer. So let's say we lay it down horizontally first, and then we have a sheet, and then we put a top layer on it to stiffen it. And the sap in the pith acts as a natural adhesive. That's the way papyrus is made. The reason, oh, here's a picture. This, is, this doesn't show up great on this screen here. Um, but this is uh, a picture of a letter on a, on a Greek papyrus. This letter is maybe three to four millimeters tall. So this is under extreme, extreme magnification. This was actually a, a papyrus that my colleague uh, uh, Brett Landau and I were working on at Oxford a while ago. But what it illustrates is you can see the fiber direction here. So here we have vertical fiber direction. Okay. And sometimes the papyrus will become damaged or abraded, and that top layer will scuff off. You can see a little bit of that taking place here. And that reveals the under layer, which is going in the opposite direction. Okay. So top fibers are vertical, or um, yeah, vertical, back fibers are horizontal here. Trust me, this matters, okay? We'll get <laughs> so if we look at the fiber direction on the Willoughby papyrus, we can see that the John side is written with the fibers. You can, when you go look at the, the fragment out there, you can see, if you look very closely, that it's written with the fibers. And the unidentified Christian text on the back is written against the fibers. The other thing that's interesting, when we've got the images side by side here, is that if you were to just flip this text over, this text would be upside down. Right? So you have to flip this text over and then rotate it uh, in order to get this image. Okay? So not only is this written against the fibers, it's also flipped 180 degrees in relation to the front text. Okay? Now, this matters because it helps us reconstruct what kind of a book this was. So scribes tended, more often than not, and most of the time is what I mean by more often than not, to write with the fibers when they're writing a scroll. Uh, you can imagine you're using a reed stylus. You don't want to be fighting against vertical fibers. You want to be writing with horizontal fibers. So the preference was to write with the fibers. Now, if you were in a bind and you desperately needed some papyrus to copy out your letter to the Hebrews, you could write against the grain for a sustained period of time, but it's not as natural as writing with the fibers. So that suggests to us that this was probably the first text written. Okay? Then this text was later written, but it was written upside down in relation to the front text. Why? Well, this is, this is my, my hypothesis. If you're going to re-inscribe an existing scroll you kind of have to rotate it, unless you're going to roll the whole thing out and then flip it. Now, I brought a little visual aid here. This is not an ancient scroll. This is a piece of printer paper. <laughs> but you can see, say this is my John text right here. Okay? And I've, I've got the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, etc. Right? And I decide I want to reuse this. If I just flip it over, I can't go anywhere unless I'm writing in Hebrew or a language that goes in the other direction. So I then have to rotate it 180 degrees. Now, there are other ways to do this, for sure. You could simply do that and then flip it over. But the material record suggests that scribes didn't do that as often as they rotated it 180 degrees. So what we have here was probably a text of John written out in scroll form, uh, format, and then it was then flipped horizontally, rotated 180 degrees, and then re-inscribed with this uh, um, unidentified Christian text. 
Now, having said this, I don't think this is the missing link. And there's more work that needs to be done on this. I don't think this is the missing link, meaning I don't think this is an example of a New Testament text written on a scroll so ancient that it was actually written by Jesus followers who identified as Jews or members of the, of, of the Jewish movement. I say that for a couple of reasons. First, the date. I've looked at the handwriting. My best guess is that this comes from sometime in the late third century, maybe the fourth century. Now, uh, while it's not a sort of tidy break between Christianity and Judaism uh, that takes place in the ancient world, there, there, the more, there is a break that happens between Jews and Christians uh, in the second and third centuries, and it would be highly unlikely for this to hail from one of those communities that remained within Judaism. Um, the other thing, and I won't get into the technical details because it involves a lot of counting of letters and, and math, um, is that the, if you reconstruct the margins of this fragment, they're much broader, the column widths, they're much broader than the widths of a normal scroll, which suggests that they show an awareness of a codex margin format. And so what that actually suggests to me is something I think is far more interesting than finding a, a long lost scroll from the first or early second century. Uh, I think it suggests that there's more of a, an interplay between the scroll technology and the codex technology uh, than we're normally willing to admit. And so I think this manuscript has the potential uh, to say a lot uh, or to speak to ongoing conversations taking place within the history of the book. Now, a second um, remarkable feature of the Willoughby Papyrus uh, is its contents. By now, you know that the front side of the papyrus includes the Gospel of John. To date, there have been 32 Greek New Testament papyri of the Gospel of John discovered. This number includes the Willoughby Papyrus. There are, uh, these are the most important manuscripts that scholars have at their disposal when attempting to reconstruct the autograph, or at least the earliest attainable version, of John's Gospel. To understand why manuscripts like the Willoughby John are so important, let us first consider where Bibles come from. So here we have a Bible in modern translation. So this is an Oxford, New Oxford Annotated Bible. A lot of students uh, get uh, assigned this if they take a religious studies course, um, this particular version. But you can imagine a Bible in Spanish, Korean, any other translation. That Bible is a translation of the Greek New Testament as established in this book. There are some alternative versions of the Greek New Testament, but this is the primary one. I've got it right here. It's the, in its 28th edition, keeps getting updated. These are all of the uh, medieval uh, and ancient manuscripts that go in to the creation of a Greek edition of the New Testament. And these manuscripts were meticulously copied by hand uh, between the 2nd and 16th centuries. Even after the printing press, we still have manuscripts uh, continuing to be produced. This is what the inside of this book looks like. And so I have it turned here to the beginning of John. Um, this is John chapter 1. It's a slightly different passage than what's covered in the Willoughby Papyrus. This text right here is the text of John's Gospel as scholars have established it on the basis of all of the different manuscripts that exist. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if all of the manuscripts that survived agreed word for word, but they don't. There's a lot of differences in them. And so scholars have to look at these differences and adjudicate the readings. They have to figure out which reading is more likely uh, John, what John actually wrote, and which readings arose over time, either because of accidental uh, scribal mistakes or because of scribal alterations for other reasons. And so all the variant readings are reported in this block of tiny text. And this, keep in mind, is just the variant readings reported for John chapter 1, verse 16 to 27. Okay? So if we just take a random verse here, I won't get into this too much, but it's kind of cool. Um, so look at John 1.18. So no one at any time uh, has, has seen God. Uh, the only begotten God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, this one has explained him. Okay? 
Now, we have these funny little marks right here around only begotten God, and that means that something is up in the manuscripts. If we look down, 18, we see, oh, somebody adds the only begotten God. No big deal. That's just a definite article. But that's in a papyrus, okay? Remember, the papyri are thought to be among the most important for establishing the text of the New Testament. The next one, the only begotten Son. Uh-oh. So we've got begot, the only begot, we have only begotten God, the only begotten God. Now we have the only begotten Son. And then we have unless the only begotten, or if not the only begotten Son. Oh, someone adds only begotten Son of God there. And then we have the text as it's printed. Right? And if we were to discover a new manuscript of the Gospel of John that said, the only begotten Son of Man, we'd have to add that too. Okay? So it's the, the task of scholars, of New Testament text critics, to draw upon the extant manuscript evidence uh, to try and reconstruct the most likely text of John so that that can be then translated into Bibles which would be used uh, by people of faith. Um, now if you look at this apparatus, just briefly, you can see that the va so these P's in the Gothic font, those are papyri. There's not a lot. A lot of them are other kinds of manuscripts. So anytime we find a new P, like we just have, it's really important. So the, um, so now that the Willoughby Papyrus has been published, it will be incorporated into future editions of the Greek New Testament, so Nestle Alon edition 29, and it will play a key role in determining what John actually wrote at the end of chapter one, the beginning of chapter two. Now, that alone is cool enough, but what makes the Willoughby Papyrus still more interesting is that the text on the backside is not the Gospel of John. Written on the back of the, uh, of the John roll and likely in the same scribal hand is an unidentified Christian text. Now, unfortunately, very little of the text survives, and its precise literary character cannot be determined at present. Nonetheless, the content of the surviving text raises the possibility that the fragment belongs to a Christian apologetic work with narrative elements, such as uh, an apocryphal acts or a martyrdom text or an apology that is a defense of the Christian religion. The progression of the text, at least as I understand it, is as follows. First, we have a theological statement. And here you can see the words, um, uh, it's harder to see up here, that's Father, you can see a little bar there, and this is God, and you can see a bar there. That's a, uh, a largely Christian manuscript convention called uh, Nomina Sacra, or Sacred Names. And the idea is that scribes, out of reverence or perhaps out of habit, would abbreviate special words when they were copying out Christian writings. God being one of them, Father being another. Sometimes you see Jerusalem, Son, all of these get abbreviated, meaning a couple of the vowels drop out, and then you get a line written over the top. Okay? So we have that in the first line, which lets us know with some good certainty that it's Christian. So a theological statement, um, something about the Father and God, and then we have perhaps an assurance that a particular house or a household is like-minded, sounds something like the beginning of, of the book of Acts, uh, which would be, um, and the entire household was of the same mind. And then there's a claim about the abstract principles of government, um, uh, the idea that they need to be sort of perfected or completed. And then there's a preaching of the gospel to a person or to a group, and there we literally have the word evangelize show up in the Greek, but we don't know if it's evangelized to him or to them or to her, we just don't know. Now, the themes of theology, unity, critique of government, and proclamation are admittedly generically Christian. But they are found together in apocryphal acts, martyrdom texts, and other types of apologetic works, such as sermons and theological treatises. Unfortunately, I am not able to say much more about the unidentified Christian text. Perhaps, perhaps someone else can make more progress deciphering it. What is clear, however, is that the will, uh, in the Willoughby Papyrus, we find a canonical text and a non-canonical text side by side, or better, back to back. 
a detail which could suggest that the canonical, non-canonical distinction that we often observe was not as stark for the scribe of this papyrus, that he had no objections to copying both kinds of writings out on the same manuscript. Now, there's more that could be said about the significance of the papyrus itself, but for the sake of time, we'll need to be content with the summary of its curious format and content. You can see the Willoughby Papyrus on display now through December 11th, as I understand it. It's been placed next to the Gutenberg Bible in the lobby. The contrast between the two books couldn't be more stark. The manuscript style print of the Gutenberg Bible is elegant and legible. The handwriting of the Willoughby Papyrus is inconsistent and, by today's standards, amateurish. There is a nice contrast between the bright white page and the dark luster of the ink on the Gutenberg Bible. The ink of the Willoughby papyrus is brownish and blends in at times with the dark hue of the papyrus fibers, making letter forms occasionally difficult to make out. The Willoughby papyrus lacks the decoration, the ornamentation, and the scribal flourishes of the Gutenberg Bible. But despite these differences, they belong to the same tradition. In fact, they are open to the same passage. Willoughby Papyrus has no choice. In the end, uh, sorry, the end of Jesus' calling of the disciples and the start of the wedding at Cana, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, according to the fourth gospel. The Willoughby Papyrus and the Gutenberg Bible are, in a sense, bookends of a Christian manuscript tradition that spanned a millennium and a half. Now, there's more work to be done on the Willoughby Papyrus. I've assigned the manuscript a date on the basis of paleography, that is, the style of handwriting. But paleography is more of an art than a science. We need, what we need is scientific testing, both of the papyrus and of its ink, to assign it a more objective date and determine the composition of its ink. We also need to work to identify, if at all possible, the unidentified Christian texts on the back. It does not appear to belong to a known Greek text, but perhaps the unidentified Christian writing otherwise survives in another ancient language. Latin, Coptic, Syriac. Yes, more work needs to be done. But now that the Willoughby Papyrus has a permanent home in the Harry Ransom Center, now that it's in good hands, that work can be done. Thank you. We good? All right. All right, let's see in the darkness here. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Uh, we've had some preliminary talks about the possibility of doing carbon-14 testing here at UT. And obviously, if, if that's an option, it would be our preferred option. Um, and if you have connections, please send me an email. <laughs> But yeah, absolutely. Some of the non-invasive ink analysis might have to be done elsewhere. Um, I don't know if we have that if we have that technology uh, here, but it's something we're going to be looking into. There are several labs across the country that can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I wish we knew more about all of these scribes. Um, my guess is somebody in Egypt, uh, somebody in Egypt um, during the Roman period. Um, all we can really do is judge by the aesthetics of it. And in antiquity, there were these sort of three different styles of handwriting that we often talk about. We get this information from a, uh, an edict that was issued by the emperor who was attempting to fix prices on certain kinds of labor. And uh, so he distinguishes the, the most beautiful calligraphic style of handwriting. This is not that. Um, and then uh, a sort of uh, a really crude, sort of almost documentary style handwriting. This is not that. This is the sort of Goldilocks hand in the middle. Um, and, and so because of that, you know, it still would not have been cheap to produce. Um, but it would not have been the most expensive kind of book to produce. 
Um, and we often, when we think of ancient books, we don't think about labor or cost, but those are very real factors. Papyrus costs money. You have to make the ink. You need the scribal labor, um, and, and all of that adds up. So this would have been, uh, I guess, a sort of middle-of-the-road uh, uh, manuscript in terms of expense, uh, but it would have been expensive nonetheless. Uh, beyond that, it's really hard to know. I, I will add, though, that maybe from the, the, the abbreviations of the sacred name that the person was um, a Christian or very well um, um, acquainted with the Christian tradition. There, there were other attempts. Um, the advantage I had was that I was the only one who knew the identity of the owner um, beyond his eBay username. Um, and he, 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 he told me his name, and he told me to not share his name with anybody. Um, and so I've kept that. And I've shared the name maybe with one or two people only after I asked him for permission. And so because of that, a lot of people wanted it, but they didn't know who to contact. Um, and I will say that it was only earlier in this year that the papyrus actually, I don't remember the date, but I do remember being very excited uh, during the unboxing of the papyrus <laughs> earlier this semester. It was only earlier in this academic year that the papyrus made it to UT. So we're talking ab about, about seven and a half years of negotiation. Off and on, but it was a lot of work. In the middle there? Yeah, so if you find a little fragment from a codex, let's say this was a John codex, right? If you have the end of John 1, the beginning of John 2 on one side, if you flip it over, you'll have John 2, right? It'll be like John 2.14 or John 2.10 or something like that. And you can imagine the sort of progression of the text continuing past where the manuscript breaks off and then continuing on the next page and then meeting up. Same thing if you were to cut a little piece out of like you know any book today. Um, but if it's, a, if it's blank on the other side, there's a good chance it's a scroll. Uh, it could also be toward the end of a codex. Um, but if there's a text upside down in relation to it on the other side, I'd say it's an even better case that it's a scroll because of some work that's been done actually by a UT uh, grad, um, uh, Brent Nongbri. Um, he graduated uh, with his undergrad degree here on reused scrolls in the ancient world. It does seem like this is, uh, this is a, a well-documentable scroll phenomenon of rotating it to reuse it. But definitely not a codex. Yeah. All the way in the back corner. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right to suggest that, that certainly carbon-14 dating requires a, a sample. And so that's one of the the real challenges um, with sort of thinking about how to approach this. There are some sections, um, if you look at images of it, peninsulas, as it were, that are uninked on both sides. And so there are some candidates there. But this is a, would be a, a definitely a major point of negotiation to figure out exactly how to approach this and what size of samples are needed for modern testing methods. Right. And I will clarify that, that you know, even though religious studies uh, played an active role in acquiring it, the fragment belongs to the Harry Ransom Center. So all the decisions will need to be made in-house here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one, I, it, you know, the screenshot I showed you was $99, no reserve. There was one bid. Uh, by the time I got him to take it down, it was not $99 anymore. Um, so, and I also want to say that I'm really hesitant as a scholar of the ancient world and primarily a manuscript scholar to talk about ethics and economics. Um, but, but, but in this case, it seemed to me that the ethical thing to do uh, was to first um, have him and the auction, because that was not a fitting fate for a manuscript like this. And, and second was to figure out what the heck to do next. And, and, and what I found was that an argument that I made to the seller that turned out to be 
particularly compelling to him, but I think also, you know, the, the right way to go about this was to argue about, to, to, to make the claim about the legacy of Harold Willoughby and how he had dedicated his life uh, to uh, finding manuscripts uh, and bringing them into a really important library where they could be studied and conserved. And that, that's ultimately what this fragment needed to have done to it as well. Um, now, there was an economic component to it, um, and uh, I, I wish in part there weren't, but I'm also realistic that these things are valuable. I mean, there's, there's only, only 141 of these things out there. Um, uh, but in the end, I'm very happy with the way it ended, and, uh, and I, think, I think we did the right thing. All the way in the back there. Uh, I brought my article in case I got that question, but it's all the way over there. So I'm going to just remember. Um, I think it agrees uh, with the Nestle Elan text. Um, uh, but what, what it does is it lends more manuscript support to the readings that have already been preferred. Yeah, uh, lots of, lots of, oh, what, did we ever discover what else was in Harold Willoughby's suitcase? <laughs> yes, uh, it's mostly uh, his papers, letters to people, um, pre-publication drafts of articles, page proofs, um, those kinds of things. There, there are, um, the, the owner also, the, the previous owner also has um, some of Harold Willoughby's travel journals. And I, I would really like to acquire those as well so that we can um, not only see if it fills in the story a little bit about the Willoughby papyrus, but so that we can get a better sense of, of the sort of travels and purchases of, of an important scholar in the first half of the 20th century. Um, beyond that, um, a lot of his books were given to a, a local a small college library in the Midwest when he died. And I. I I have not been able to track those down. No idea where those other manuscripts ended up. Let's go one more question. Let's see here. Um, right there. Go on. Yeah, actually, um, uh, when I showed you those negatives, um, those were found by Margaret Mitchell, uh, a very famous New Testament scholar at the University of Chicago, when I emailed her and asked her if she'd do me a favor and look through those folders. Um, so uh, they, th uh, they played an active role in helping me come up with a little more documentation on the Willoughby Papyrus. Well, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank our speaker again. And we're going to be a thank you. Thank you. Well done.